Anthony Zinkas. He has over 25 years experience in the fields of child welfare and victim services and as the Senior Director of Education and Communications at the Victims Information Bureau in Suffolk, or VIBES, he speaks both regionally and nationally on family violence, <coughs> trauma, and inequality and its impact on individuals, families, and communities. And in 2016, he did a TED Talk on the effects of inequality on the developing brains of children. Anthony is also an adjunct professor teaching graduate social work at Columbia University and Adelphi University. <coughs> and Anthony is going to talk a bit about history, who gets to write it, and its impact on us. Please welcome Anthony. <clears throat> That's not me. <laughs> but it describes me, I'm a cisgendered, for those that don't know cisgender, I identify with the gender that I was assigned at birth. Heterosexual, white guy from Long Island. I really don't know anything about not being white. But I think it's important to acknowledge my positionality and also acknowledge my privilege, which for the longest time, I did not know that I had. I did not know that I had male privilege. I did not know that walking across a parking lot in the middle, you know, at a late hour when it's dark, uh, and, and not being worried about anything except being able to find my car was privilege, but it is. That's male privilege. And I didn't know that I had white privilege for the longest time either, and I thought because I didn't identify as racist, that meant that racism really wasn't a problem. See, that's the problem that a lot of white people have. They think that when we look at things from our perspective, that just must be the way the world is, and we don't understand. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history, and I really appreciate the, the genetic component of this, to show that race doesn't exist, it's a social construct, but what's interesting to me is why was it constructed in the first place? Whiteness is an invention, so if you read a book that I, by ta Coates uh, called Between the World and Me, and I highly recommend that you read it, phenomenal book, he refers to people with skin color like mine as being people who believe themselves to be white, and that is an accurate description because there is no difference. Right? This, is, this is a skin tone, this is a skin color. It is not a racial identity, but whiteness became a racial identity. In the 1660s and 1670s in the colonies, African and Caribbean people who were seen, a, 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 you know, who had black and brown skin, and white Europeans shared something in common. They were indentured servants. And the elite landowners from Europe who made money off of that indentured servitude, treated them very badly. And the Africans and the Europeans who were indentured began to coalesce and began to rebel against the elite landowners who controlled the wealth, the property, and, uh, and the power and the resources in the colonies at the time that were to become America. And the elites didn't like that, so they decided that the Africans and the Europeans who were indentured getting together was a very dangerous thing. So they bestowed some privileges upon the white Europeans. And one of the things they did was they gave them the power to be in slave patrols so that they could be the people who jailed and caught the, the African indentured servants. And then the indentured servitude became permanent servitude. So they, they invented whiteness to preserve their hold on wealth, resources, and power in the United States. And that was a deliberate thing. And by the 1800s, early 1800s, 1830s, there were articles about whiteness. But before that, people did not identify as being white. They identified as being from a city-state, right? Italy wasn't even a nation until the 1860s. Right? They identified from being the city where they were from. They didn't identify as being white or black. And it served a purpose. It served a purpose to preserve the privilege and supremacy of a small amount of wealthy landowners. And if you think about that, in the Civil War, most of the people who fought on the side of the South in the Civil War, and the stated reason for the Civil War was to preserve and expand slavery throughout the New World. That was the stated reason, all the reasons that people say, well, with states' rights, yeah, states' rights to own slaves, that's exactly what those rights were. How did they get people who did not own slaves to fight for them because they bestowed privileges upon them and they said, look, if you free the slaves, they're going to take your jobs. 
fast forward to 2016, 2017, 2018 in the United States. What are we told about the border? What are we told about people who are coming in from the south border, from Mexico, from Guatemala, from Honduras, from those countries, that they're going to take our jobs without even having a discussion that globalism has made borders irrelevant? Because we've been shipping jobs all over to emerging economies and undeveloped economies for decades. So whether 5,000 people in a caravan come into the United States, that's not going to make a difference in anybody's job. But divide and conquer, bestowing some privileges among working class whites, helps them feel different, helps them feel special, helps them feel superior. So I don't think we can have a conversation about race without having a conversation about supremacy about white privilege and white supremacy, that's the disease, that's the problem. Racism is a secondary problem. Racism is what props up supremacy. Long Island is one of the most racially segregated areas in the United States for a reason. We also have a few of the richest, most wealthiest communities in the entire country right here. And I want to draw a parallel because the elites in the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s, when they invented whiteness and blackness to keep some people over here, did it to preserve their power and their wealth. So there is an inextricable link between economic inequality and racial inequality in the United States. But it seems that we are only allowed to talk about the race piece when they allow us to talk about it. We don't get to talk about class, but class and race are inextricably linked. This is just a little bit of that history. Whites were allowed to bear arms. Black people were not allowed to bear arms. Whites could beat black or brown people regardless of whether they owned them or not. Okay, And so we talk about the rule of law. The Supreme Court, the only time it ever decided anything on slavery, upheld it and said it was fine, said it was okay. That's what the laws of the land said. Well, fast forward, after the Emancipation Proclamation, what happened when, quote unquote, the slaves were freed, Jim Crow was instituted. Not because people hated people with black and brown skin, although that did happen. Jim Crow was instituted to prevent black and brown Americans from accessing resources and from gaining a part of the economic pie of the United States. Mass incarceration grew out of that. In 1994, when Bill Clinton signed the crime bill, there were 750,000 people roughly in prison in the United States. Now there's over two and a half million. We have the largest percentage of our population in prison of any country in the world ever in history. And mass incarceration was not designed for skin the skin tones of people like mine. And when we look at crime, I mean, crime is a selective thing in the United States. The biggest crime ever to happen in the history of the United States was when banks crashed the economy in 2008, committing criminal fraud, costing trillions of dollars and nearly crashing the global economy. And not one banker, most of them being white men, ever went to jail for those crimes. But I urge you to go on YouTube and look at interviews with a young man named Khalif Browder, K-A-L-I-E-F Browder, B-R-O-W-D-E-R, -E who at the age of 16 in New York City was arrested ostensibly for stealing a backpack and was thrown in Rikers and languished there for three years because his mother, economic inequality here, his mother could not afford the $3,500 bail that it would cost to take her son out of jail. He was in solitary confinement for two of those three years and hung himself and committed suicide after he got out of jail at the age of 22. His mother died of stress and a broken heart after that. What happens to people when we other them? when we treat them like they are less than human. David Jonathan Kozel talked about this in the 1960s. He talked about death at an early age, literally being othered, being treated badly, being looked at as you are less than human, actually affects us on a cellular level. We were talking about DNA. Our genes don't do what we think they do in the way we, they, we think they do them. Genes respond to the environment, and when we are treated well, when we are treated like human beings, when we are given the opportunity to grow and be our best and reach our fullest capacity, we do. But when we diminish people, it literally can affect their ability for academic achievement and for success. 
The last thing I want to say is that when we look then at black and brown communities and say, why the lack of academic achievement? Why crime? Why this? What we're not looking at is the equation. How did things get this way? Racial inequality and economic inequality have results and consequences, and those consequences are what we're living with today. The ask that I'm giving here is this. We can't have discussions about racism unless we have discussions about privilege and supremacy. And white folks, we have to talk amongst ourselves and, and ask ourselves, what are we going to give up? Because if we are not willing to give up power, then we can't fundamentally reach the dream that is supposedly America, which is a democracy where everybody can freely participate. That's something that really has to be discussed. Thanks. Thank you.